Welcome to the Writing One presentation, Causal Analysis. Please follow along with this presentation by opening your How to Write Anything book to Chapter 5. Let's start off this presentation by defining what causal analysis is. Basically, it's when you, the writer, examines issues of cause and effect. And most of us are very familiar with this idea of cause and effect. One thing causes another. Um, and of course the thing that causes something is the cause and whatever happens is the effect. Some places in this chapter they'll use the term event as well. This approach is often used in many classes across the academic disciplines so when we're talking about this style of writing uh, it's important you know that when we discuss styles of writing especially this one we're not just talking about one specific thing that you'll learn for writing one and maybe writing two and that's all you need to know. These are pretty common types of papers to write and oftentimes uh, instructors and professors won't be specific about what type of paper to write but this is the sort of thing they have in mind. It includes a blend of research and critical thinking along with argument writing skills and just notice that the singular version of the word analysis is spelled with an IS at the end the plural is spelled with an ES and I'll usually pronounce that analyses uh, just to make sure that you hear the difference but um, some people will pronounce it uh, both ways. Um, you also should know that analysis in this case um, is what's called a non-count noun for those of you who learned that way of thinking. Um, usually that's just covered in ESL, but it's a non-count noun. So we would say, here is some analysis, and it would be just a non-count. You can't count analysis, but you could count analysis papers or pieces of analysis. Um, so when we use plural, we're talking Instead of saying pieces of analysis, we're just saying analyses. Um, hopefully that's not too confusing, and it shouldn't really make too much of a difference here, but I want you to be clear on the different spellings and why you might see different versions. To help us better understand what causal analysis is, we're going to run down the different examples they give on page 128. I did add and uh, adjust their definitions here, but this is still based on what they say. What they call a causal analysis here, it's, it's a little bit confusing honestly because they titled the chapter is they titled the chapter causal analyses meaning different ways to do a causal analysis but then they name one of them specifically causal analysis which to me is a little bit confusing but we're gonna roll with it so what they define uh, in that type of a writing project is you're examining the root cause of an event phenomenon trend etc et um, you might ask some questions like what do credible experts and sources identify as root causes what inconsistencies and contradictions do I see? How can I synthesize their ideas to form my own thesis and theories? And by synthesis, we mean that you're taking two or more sources and you're sort of taking their ideas and using them to form your own new idea. So that doesn't mean you don't give them tribute and that doesn't mean you don't cite them or anything like that. What it means is you're taking two or more ingredients and mixing them up together for one new product or the synthesis, and this is used often in science class, but we use it in writing as well. So the idea here is, is that you can take various people who have different ideas about the root cause of an event, and you can study it and use it to sort of blend your own um, ideas on this and kind of combine them all into one, one new theory. Um, another is a research relationship study, and I added that word relationship in because they use it, use it uh, in their explanation in the book, but they don't really put it in the title. So I did that just to make it a little bit clearer. And that is where you're trying to discover a relationship between two things that might be a cause and effect. So this one is where maybe you don't have a lot of sources to go on early on, but you notice, you observe something. Um, and so you want to ask, do my observations match the data? So then you'd go out and find data about such a thing. Um, the example that they use here in the book is that uh, someone notices that self, uh, students walk across campus chatting on cell phones or listening to music and so you develop a research study to examine whether this phenomenon has any relationship to a recent drop in the numbers of students joining campus clubs and activities across the country. So again this is where maybe you read about a trend and then you notice something on your own campus or notice something in your own life and you do some research to find out if those two things might be connected. One is what's called an exploratory essay, and if you look at the way that they uh, describe it, it's going to remind you a little bit more of what we call the refutation essay in the argument chapter. It seems a little inconsistent to me, but 
Um, and when I have this on our assignment sheet, I'll put exploratory forward slash refutation essay. Um, but in this case, um, but in this case, you're responding to someone else's ideas and actions regarding cause and effect. So maybe you read an article about something. In this case, um, they're talking about not so much an article, but um, an actual event or an actual happening, um, an actual new policy where uh, your, somebody at your school proposed to tie future fee and in tuition increases to the rate of inflation. And you think, wow, that doesn't seem right. So um, here, you know, this person's saying, well, cause and effect has a certain relationship, so we need to do this. And you're saying, well, I'm not sure about that. So you're going in data and credible expert opinions to show alternative views and actions. You can also do what's called a cultural analysis. And in that case, you're looking at something specifically cultural, um, asking what caused this, or possibly what could be effective of all this. Um, they give an example about the mullet haircut, which is, uh, many people describe that as business in the front, party in the back. That's where you have a short haircut up front and longer hair. And some of us who are losing our hair up front just sort of naturally fall into this if we don't get haircuts. Um, and that could explain it. But as a fashion, it's something that kind of comes back once in a while. And so, and so you could ask yourself, you know, why is this persisting? You know, why does this haircut style survive? even though people make fun of it. So, um, as I say, what explains its enduring popularity? Why is it so popular? Um, so you could get into stuff like that where you do some cultural analysis. That's uh, kind of a silly example that they have, but you know, it'd be a fun paper and you can do this with other things in our culture as well. You wanna start with some questions and that's pretty common to most of the types of writing that you're gonna do in college and, and the ones that we've studied, but in this case, you want to ask yourself questions like why and how and what if. Uh, some specific questions centered around that. Why did this happen? Or what effects might this trend, attitude, action, or idea have? Or why might this assumption or action be wrong based on other ideas and evidence? Or how? How are these things related? How did the situation get better or worse? How could we have avoided this or avoid problems in the future? Or how did this great thing come about? Or what if, you know, what if we tried this? Or what if things had gone differently? You know, all kinds of good things that we can do. And you may be wondering about the picture here. That's actually from a creative writing class that I teach. And in addition to the other creative writing assignments that students have to do, they also have to do some sort of a, either a tribute to an artist that they enjoy or some type of analysis having to do with uh, artists and specifically creative writers um, or some other type of artist that inspires them basically. So it's a fun project and we get a lot of ideas and, and really that's the idea of the project is to just toss around some ideas and one of our students did hers on Lady Gaga versus Marilyn Monroe and Madonna and again she's asking questions about how are these things related um, or what effects might this trend, attitude, action, or idea have. She talked about those things in her presentation as well. And so again, this is an example of something that we would call cultural analysis, of course, um, but it's asking these questions about how things are related and about different trends and how they might affect other trends. Um, those are examples of things that you could do. Oh, and with this picture, I should point out that this person uh, giving the presentation in character uh, decided that she was actually going to dress in character as Lady Gaga. So that added a really intriguing element to it as well because she was able to take things like fashion and uh, things like image and roll that into her cultural analysis as well. And again, that's an example of a causal analysis. Don't jump to conclusions. And as we saw in the logical fallacy chapter last time um, in our argument section, this is something that happens and people sometimes lose their critical thinking skills when they get ideas or have a strong opinion. And so, we have to make sure that we don't just jump to the first conclusion jump to the first conclusion that seems to offer itself or to the conclusion that we think fits best within our world view so um, they talk about here um, sometimes it's tough to uh, discuss um, what a cause was and it's even harder to say what might happen you know predicting the future if, if things are. so don't just go for a simple or simplistic idea here. You know, you don't want to make this a super complicated paper, but you also don't want this to be so simplistic that nobody's going to buy it and you lose your credibility. Um, and I like what they say in the book here. This is the second paragraph under Don't Jump to Conclusions. 
Trying to explain things to other people will quickly teach you humility, even if you don't jump to hasty conclusions. In fact, many explanations of cause and effect begin by undercutting or correcting someone else's prior claims, dutifully researched and sensibly presented. So, again, good, good words here. Another piece of advice is to appreciate your limits. And again, saying here, a lot of times there are not easy answers, and we can't always completely answer something, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't write about it and explore it a little bit. Uh, sometimes we need to, you know, again, qualify, and they talked about this in the first section too, sometimes you need to qualify things and appreciate that you can't completely answer a question or predict something. Um, we do need to make sure that we offer sufficient evidence for our claims as well, and this is a skill we've been building on for the entire semester, and we don't want to lose it now. We want to keep getting better and better with our research and make sure that we're using really good research and really good evidence to support whatever. These are pages that you should read through on your own, but I'm going to hit a couple of highlights here. Um, identifying your purpose and topic. You want to start with questions and background info from what you already know. Now that may not be a whole lot in some cases. and uh, in some cases, you might know a little bit about something or you've heard about something, but you're interested in researching it more, but you're interested in researching it more. But yeah, I mean, as you start, again, just like we said with other papers, you don't always have to know exactly where you're going with a paper when you start to research. Um, so some other options for looking for your purpose or finding a good topic is to look again at a subject that you know well. Um, on the other side of that is to look for an issue new to you. And sometimes looking at something that you haven't really thought about before gives you fresh eyes for it and you don't fall into some of your own traps um, that come with you know, being so closely tied to something. So this is a call that you're going to need to make. Um, some options that we could think about and we'll have uh, more ideas of course um, as we go along. But look again at a subject that you know well, look for an issue new to you, uh, like we said. Another option is to examine a local issue. and. I like the idea of looking at something that's a problem or an issue or a current subject of debate locally, whether it's uh, here around uh, where our campus is or around where you live, um, and talk about those causes and effects. You also want to choose a subject with many dimensions. And getting into an issue that's complicated and challenging can really help your writing skills. Even more so, it can help your critical thinking skills. So don't be afraid to push yourself. That's the idea with this paper is that we're really pushing ourselves intellectually. And then uh, another thing that you could do if you really want to challenge yourself is tackle an issue that seems settled. Um, some people like these TV shows where they open up these cold cases, right? Um, or they take a case that they think has been solved many years ago and they find new evidence and they want to re-examine it. Again, that's the sort of thing that you could do is take something that seems like, you know, maybe society's moving in a certain direction with things, but you want to re-examine it. Um, you also want to understand your audience and there are some really interesting um, ideas in there. Um, the two sort of things that they talk about are to either create an audience, which means you're trying to make people care about a topic, or sometimes you're writing to people who already do care about a topic, um, and that's where you would write to an existing audience. So again, you also decide which. Some thoughts about structures for your writing. Um, again, most of us uh, are okay coming up with ideas um, once we get our topics rolling and get some research going. Um, some people do struggle with ideas, but a lot of people, they start getting ideas, but they really need to consider their structure. So make sure you, so make sure you plan a lot with this essay and, and decide what structure will work. Oftentimes causal analyses require longer introductions. Um, that way you can help readers better understand your subject's significance and background. Um, because again, oftentimes you do have to explain some background or explain why it really matters um, um, to your reader. So your introduction may stretch past just one simple paragraph. I encourage you to look at these examples in the book and uh, for those of you who might like using more of a template, um, and I know some students work really well off of that even just for making an outline, you should definitely check out these examples in the chapter. One of the things you'll notice is, is that some of them are basic, some of them explore different uh, approaches as detailed on the slide. Um, so make sure you look at both pages of those examples and templates as you're getting started. Um, some suggested appro ex approaches explain why something happened, happened, explain the consequences of a phenomenon or a trend, something like that, uh, suggest an alternative view of cause and effect, or explain the chain of causes. And again, we just looked at reciprocal causes. 
um, something uh, right there might ring true to you. Maybe we do something that enables more poor behavior, which causes an even bigger problem. As far as uh, design itself, we don't really need to worry about that because we're going to be doing these in APA or MLA format. As far as style, they recommend using a middle style. Um, and you can read more about that there on, on that page. Um, but basically that means it's not super highly formal. Um, if you want to practice writing that, writing that way, that would be great. But it doesn't have to be super formal, but again, it's not completely informal and just, you know, randomly, uh, you know, using slang and things like that. Um, it's kind of a middle style. So it is still professional and it is still something that uh, you're trying to come across as educated and smart.